Good morning, church. Let's all stand as we praise and worship the Lord today. in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the saith the church. I love worshiping with you guys on Sunday morning. Before I go over and, and lead the kids, it is an honor and a blessing to sing alongside you guys. So thank you. It is always fun to worship a God together as a group. I do have some quick announcements for you. If you would, just pull your phone out or you can grab that blue card in front of you. But if you pull your phone out, open the camera app and point it at the little image on the seat in front of you. Click on the link. It'll take you to a page where you can check in, give prayer requests to your pastors. You can tell us anything that's on your heart. It'll also take you to an info page where we've got lots of things, including Pastor Dan's sermon notes and all the all the fun stuff that's happening over the summer. Or you can take that blue card and fill it out and put it in one of the offering boxes on your way out. But leading into what's happening at the church this summer, I want to I share with you that if you go to our website, there will be a little pop-up at the bottom, and it'll say, uh, Stetson Summer Plans. And if you click on that, it'll take you to a new page where you can see what's happening in all the different age ministries and what's going on. And so I want to give you a demonstration of what that what that might look like. You, just, you ready to get out your notes and your pens and get ready to take notes? You guys, you guys got it? I'll show it to you again. Here we go. You got it, right? You know what's going on this summer. You guys are fully in. You put it all on your calendar, right? Maybe one more time, one more time. You're good. You're not good. That's why we put it on the website. Go to go to go to our website. 
click on what's happening this summer. Or if you just want to type it all in the URL box in stetson.church slash summer, and you will get there. We want you to know that this church is busy this summer. We are doing a lot of things. There are people moving constantly. And if you want to be a part of that and know what's happening, rather than squinting at the list on the screen behind me, just go to that website and you can be plugged in to know what's going on. All right. Um, last thing, I have a, an exciting announcement beyond just how busy we are this summer. July 3rd, we're going to have one consolidated service. So rather than three, we'll have one service on July 3rd at 1030. And it's going to be a very special service. We're going to go and we're going to pray and we're going to read scripture and do some things in the worship center as it's being renovated. And so we're going to have an opportunity to, to move from here to over there and really just take some concerted time as a church to pray over that space and, and ask God's will to be done in that place. And so the July 3rd, 1030, come here for one combined service and then all together as one large unified church, we're going to move over and pray over and write scripture and, and Pastor Dan will give us some, some great instruction on what that looks like, but just a, a really powerful opportunity to just kind of steep that place in prayer as we're working through it. And so I'm excited about that. So July 3rd, if you missed that previous screen, make sure you get July 3rd on your calendar. That's an important one. And then pray with me. And let's get back to worship. Dear God, I just want to thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to come and to sing out to you. God, I just praise you that you are deserving of our praise, and that you are the only thing deserving of our praise. And God, this morning, I pray that you help us to remove all of the distractions from our lives, to focus solely on the one true important thing this morning, and that is you. God, I pray that if anybody in here doesn't know you, God, that you would move in their life this morning or anybody watching online. But God, I pray that for the rest of us in this room that do know you, you just continue to stir our hearts towards you. God, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest near to Um, uh, just a quick thing for you to be in prayer about. Uh, uh, several of our pastors are already on their way. Uh, my wife and I and uh, uh, Andrew, our student pastor and his wife, will be on the way to Anaheim, California uh, over the course of these next several days. Uh, there is the Southern Baptist Convention annual meeting that is happening in Anaheim. And uh, for those of you who absolutely know nothing about the Southern Baptist Convention annual meeting, count your blessings. Because sometimes when you get a bunch of people together, they just come together for a meeting and sometimes it turns out to be a fight. Um, and I'm not expecting that. I'm expecting that there will be a lot of good things that are happening. But um, we certainly would appreciate your prayers uh, over the next several days as there will be a lot that will be discussed. There are some, some real, you know, issues and concerns that we need to deal with and things that, you know, when you have a large group of people, you know, there, there are a lot of Southern Baptist churches. I don't know if you know that, but there are a ton. You are a part of a denomination, a, a, a 
a conglomeration of churches that is large, that is uh, powerful, that has a great missionary sending force and so many wonderful opportunities. And so uh, I, I, I'm not going to get ahead of myself because two weeks from now, I'm going to come back and I'm going to preach a message. This doesn't sound very much like a, a sermon, but I think it's important. We're going to talk about what is a Southern Baptist. And we're going to talk about what we believe and how we are and, and you know, just uh, some of the things that, that we have an opportunity to be a part of by being a part of this convention of churches. I intentionally put that a week after uh, the, uh, the, the, the annual meeting happens. And so anyway, just certainly would appreciate your prayers for a lot of things, uh, not the least of which is the three-hour jet lag that we're all going to be dealing with. So, uh, so that will be a little bit interesting. As we think about Southern Baptists, though, one of the things that you should ask a question is the question of what do we in our church and as a convention, as a denomination, what do we believe? How many of you have ever asked that question of maybe the church that, that you were attending? Have you ever asked, well, what exactly do we believe? Anybody? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember growing up. I mean, I, 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 was, I was Southern Baptist before, before I was even born. I was in the church and a part of the church, and I grew up in the church. I grew up through uh, the cradle roll, through the nursery, through the Sunday school, through VBS, through uh, the student ministry. And there, was a, there were several points along the way that I, I started asking myself that question. What, what do we believe? And what makes our belief and our church and our denomination different than maybe other denominations or other churches or other beliefs? I, I had lots of questions about that. I think those are natural questions. If you're not asking that, then you might just be, you know, kind of taking it hook, line, and sinker and not asking yourself some good questions. It, it's good to ask questions about what do we believe? And I'm going to go ahead and give you the end before we start. Really, the question that you should be asking is, what do I believe? I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about you. What do I believe? What, what is my belief structure? Because if we don't know what we believe, then we'll fall for anything. We'll listen to anybody. We'll pay attention to what any, anybody presents, and we'll just kind of start saying, well, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, that sounds good. I like that. I like a little piece of that. And suddenly, we don't have any religion or Christianity or belief system at all. Because we believe it all, as long as the person that presented it, presented it well. And that shouldn't be how we do things. We should have an understanding of what we believe. So, to do that, I want us to look at a passage of Scripture in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to look at the first six verses. So, if you will turn there. I'll read it for us. It'll show up there on the screen, or you can turn to your scripture. We also have those sermon notes uh, that, uh, that Justin referred to earlier. Listen to what it says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another, in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now, to, to understand what is being said there, you need to understand a little bit of a background behind, uh, behind Paul. So Paul wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus. Paul was a trained Pharisee. He was a very religious person. Uh, as a matter of fact, he was so religious in the Jewish religion that when Christianity really started to kind of bubble up, Paul took it upon himself to try to push Christianity down, even to the point of raiding and murdering raiding churches and murdering Christians. If he didn't murder them, he would, uh, he would arrest them and put them in prison because they didn't believe rightly. Paul knew what he believed. He was very serious about what he believed. And then one day on the road, from, uh, on the road to Damascus, Paul met Jesus. 
And Paul's, at that point his name was Saul, but Saul's life was changed so much so that literally his, his name was changed to Paul. And he became a follower of Christ. He changed from one who attacked the cause of Christ to one who followed Jesus and proclaimed him and started churches and went on missionary journeys and supported churches. And the church at Ephesus was one of the churches that he supported. And many times he would write these letters. The, the, the book of Romans is one of Paul's letters. The book of Titus is one of Paul's letters. Philippians is one of Paul's letters. Colossians, first and second, are two of Paul's letters. So Paul would write these letters. And many times the way that Paul would write is he would write in such a way that at the beginning of the letter, he would write kind of a, a theology or a belief system or, hey, we need to understand some things. Let's set some things straight. There's some things I've heard about you. These are good. These are bad. You need to correct these. You need to keep going with those. And then towards the middle of his letters, he would write a word like therefore or because of or since then. And what he was saying was, I've given you all of this theology, this belief system so therefore, how should you act? How should you live? How should you be? He, it, most scholars say that Paul would write a theological section and a practical section. Well, you might have noticed at the beginning of the scripture that we read today, it says, I therefore. And what, is, what that is, is that's the break in the letter to the church at Ephesus, where Paul is saying, for chapters 1, 2, and 3, I have basically given you kind of the theology, the background behind the practical thing that I'm going to say starting in chapter 4. And he begins in chapter 4, and he begins with the church at Ephesus on how they should live, act, and most of all, believe. And so from these first six verses, we can get kind of a general sense of what Paul says we should believe, which is therefore what we should live out in our lives. And I'm going to use this as kind of a way for us to proclaim what we believe as a church. Number one, we believe in living rightly. We believe in living rightly rightly. Look what he says in, at the very beginning. He says, I am urging you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Friends, one of the things that we believe is we believe that when people see us, they should see an example of Jesus. We should live in such a way that we do great, uh, great positive to the cause of Christ, not negative to the cause of Christ. Our lives should be an example to others. We should be holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, and holy, H-O-L-Y, set apart from the world. We should not look like the world. We should not act like the world. We should not speak like the world. We should not behave like the world. We need to recognize that as Christians, we are called to live differently and to live rightly. We are called to live according to the word of God. We are called to live according to the book. We are called to living according to the scripture. We are called to live rightly. And one of the things that we believe as a church is that we believe that we should all live rightly. That's number one. Number two, we believe in loving eagerly. We believe in, in loving others. Verse 2, it says, with humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Bearing with one another in love. You know, the, the reality is that, that sometimes we need to recognize that while we may be living rightly, the world is not necessarily living rightly. So does that mean that we should point our finger and curse them? No, we should show the love of Christ to them. 
I promise you, you're never going to hate someone into believing. I promise you that will never happen. But you can love them into receiving Jesus. One of the things that we see in Jesus is that when he encountered people that were wrong, he loved them. He cared for them. Now, he did not accept their wrongness. He didn't, he didn't say, well, I'm going to love you and you don't have to change. But he loved them into a relationship with him. Friends, we should do the same. Now, this is really important because sometimes in living rightly, we can fall into hating eagerly because I'm right and you're wrong. And because you're wrong, you're evil. No, because they're wrong, they're lost. And if you found a little child out in your neighborhood and they were in tears, and you walked up to them, and you said, what's wrong, little boy, little girl? I'm, I'm lost. I don't know how to get home. Would you say, well, that's the dumbest thing I've heard all day. How could you get lost like that? What is wrong with you? Would you say that to that little child? No, you would say, let me help you find the way home. The same is true in what we see every day in our lives. Because we're going to meet people every day that are wrong because they're lost. They don't know the way home. And our job is to love them and care for them enough to show them the way to meet Jesus. We must be a people who love eagerly. Thirdly, we must be a people, we believe in laboring spiritually. Laboring spiritually. This is what it says. It says, we are eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We are, we are wanting to hold on and to create unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Friends, maintaining unity is hard work. And it is spiritual work. Do you remember what Jesus said? By this will they know that you are my disciples, by your love for one another. I've illustrated it before. I'm not going to do it again this morning. But how many things just in this room divide us? There are so many things that we have that we hold very, very dear, very near to our heart. And they have a tendency to say, well, you think like that and you think like that and you feel this and you feel that. And they divide us. Friends, the Spirit of God should overcome all of that and should bring us into unity. But we have to work at it. The gravitational pull of life will always be apart from each other. We have to work at unity. We have to labor at unity. And we have to labor through the Spirit. Holy Spirit, I don't like that person let me find something to love in them. Holy Spirit, we disagree strongly about this or that. Holy Spirit, let me see you in them so that we might love one another, so that we might be united. We must labor spiritually. We must work at, at, this, at this maintaining of unity. We must be a, a loving people, loving eagerly. We must be a people that are, de that are destined and determined to live our lives the way that God would have us to live, to live rightly. And then finally, we believe in longing eternally. We believe in longing eternally. 
He says in verses four through six that we have one body and one spirit and one hope and one Lord and one faith and one baptism and one God and Father of all. What it means is that in our lives, we are tunnel vision towards eternity, knowing that everybody spends eternity somewhere. We have an opportunity to share the message of hope for eternal life in Christ. And we have the privilege as Christians of, law, of, of working, uh, working diligently while we're here, but knowing that there's going to come a day that we're going to be called home. Knowing that there will come a day that, that we will look forward and, and recognize that, that God has a plan for our lives and it's so much better than what we're experiencing here. I don't know exactly what heaven will look like. I know there are some descriptions in, in Scripture. And honestly, the Bible says specifically of those descriptions, it says that not the half has been told about what God has planned for those who are called according to his purpose. So we don't even have a, have a, have a, 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 even a, a portion of, of the understanding of what eternity in heaven will look like. We don't have even a grasp of that. Our minds cannot understand it. And yet, we look at that and we say, I'm here, but I'm looking forward to being there. So we are, uh, what do we believe? Well, we, we believe in, 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 in recognizing that we need to live rightly, that we need to love eagerly, that we need to uh, labor spiritually, and we need to long eternally. Now, let me just get really practical with you for a second. Because some of you are going to say, well, that's, that's nice, Pastor. I really appreciate that. Great. But seriously, what do we believe? Well, as, as Southern Baptists, we actually have a, a, a statement of belief. It is called the Baptist Faith and Message. And if we did this right, it's about to show up behind me. Uh, the Baptist Faith and Message. Y'all go ahead and read that as we're, uh, as we're going through, okay? That is the Baptist, that is our statement of belief, now, the Baptist Faith and Message is a, is a document that was passed in the year 2000 at our Southern Baptist Convention annual meeting, the thing that we're going to be attending over the next two days. And what happened was they took a, uh, a it's still going, isn't it? We took a, uh, we took a, a document that was, uh, that was written back in, in the 60s, and, and we, uh, we kind of rewrote it in the 2000s. And by the way, the document that was written in the 60s was written from a document that was written in the 20s, and then the document that was written in the 20s was was written from a document that was written in the 1800s. It's just been a revision after revision after revision, but it's called the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. Now, I'm going to do that to you one more time, and the reason that I'm going to do that to you one more time is because I want you to see something. I'm going to, I'm going to play that one more time, and I don't want you to try to read everything, but what I do want you to see is all of the blue letters. Do you see the blue letters at the ends of every single one of these? Blue letters. Blue letters. Blue letters. Okay, you can, I think you can take that off. That's going to be crazy if we can't. Yeah. So here's the deal. All of those blue letters are references to Scripture. So the beautiful thing about the Baptist Faith and Message, and you can look it up on your own, the beautiful thing about the Baptist Faith and Message is that it is all based on the Word of God. What Baptists say is, what do we believe? Yes, there is a statement of belief. But at the end of the day, we believe the Bible. We believe the Bible is the Word of God. We believe the Bible is our guide for life. We believe the Bible is our statement of faith. We believe that what we believe is from the Word of God. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's, uh, there, there's a phrase that is said about Southern Baptists that we are a people of the book. This is the book, by the way. We're people of the book. We, we simply read the Bible and say, this is what I believe because it's what God wrote. That's how we, that's how we state our 
belief. So I would encourage you, if you would like, to, uh, to go and to spend some time. You can do a simple uh, Google search, and you can search Baptist Faith and Message 2000, and you will come to that document that I scrolled through for you, and you can read it on your own. It's going to take you a while. It's going to take you a while. But it's, it's powerful stuff for you to be able to see what we believe and, and why we believe it. What we believe about God, what we believe about salvation, what we believe about the Bible, what we believe about, uh, about practical issues, what we believe about uh, last things, what we believe about the family, what we believe about uh, the church, all of these different things. There are so many, so many truths in that, and I would encourage you to go do that. But that's probably still not the question you're asking. I know I said, what do we believe? And I've answered it twice now. I'm about to answer it a third time. Because the next thing that you're going to say is, okay, pastor, that's great. I appreciate the scripture from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 6. I appreciate the Baptist faith and message. But most people are going to then say something like, but what about? But what about? And the way that we think about the but what about, and this is where you say, what about, but what do you believe about this? We actually have a, a, a concept in Christian life and Baptist life, I guess, but really Christianity. I, I, I had to go to the I had to go to the emergency room a couple of uh, last year. Um, I, some of y'all remember that I was losing blood and it was kind of an interesting situation. My hemoglobin was down to like five point five. It was really really bad. For those of you who get blood tests, that's bad. So anyway, I, I, was, I was having, you know, racing heart and dizziness and weakness and almost passing out and all these kinds of things. Went to the emergency room and, uh, and, and I walked in there and I said, I'm having, I'm having some heart difficulties. And they were like, you see all those people waiting in line? And I was like, yeah. They said, you're in front of all of them. Come on in. Because heart difficulty is a serious thing. And they were like, if we sit you down and wait and make you wait, then... So what they did in that moment is they did a thing called triage. They assessed my condition and determined how important my condition was in relation to some of the other conditions in the room. As Christians, we do a thing called triage. Let me, under, let me explain. The first... Uh, the first thing that we would look at in triage would be something that would be called primary beliefs. Primary beliefs. I think it's going to show up up there. Yeah. Primary beliefs. So these are things that are crucial to our faith. Listen carefully. The deity of Jesus. Jesus is God. He is God. He is eternal. He has always been. He always will be. The virgin birth of Christ, that's a primary belief. The inerrancy of Scripture, that the Bible is true. The Trinitarian God, that God is God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son. That salvation comes through Christ alone. These are primary beliefs, and we would say if we differ on primary beliefs, we would say, we don't know if you're a Christian if you, would, if you were to come up and say, I don't believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, then we would say, well, then you don't believe what the Bible says, and so therefore we need to talk to you about whether or not you really believe in Jesus, like the Bible says. It's crucial to faith. Second is secondary beliefs. These are items that are not necessarily crucial to faith, but they are crucial to cooperation and really crucial to cooperation in a single church. So what this means is that we're not saying that if you believe differently about these items that you're not a Christian, we're going to say that we're probably going to go to different churches. This is where the name denominations comes up. Let me give you some examples. Um, infant baptism. We've talked about that a few weeks ago. There are some good friends. I have some good friends that are of churches that practice infant baptism. We do not practice infant baptism. We have a reason for that. They have a reason for that. We don't necessarily say that they're not believers. We just say that we're probably not going to participate in the same church. We have a difference of opinion about that. And it's important enough for us to go with. Views of the Lord's Supper. Views of baptism. How about this one? Version of the Bible. Now, you, some of you are going to, about to freak out here for just a second. No, 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 no. 
version of the Bible can fit into two different categories. But if you come up to me and say, there is only one version of the Bible and you have to preach and teach and read and the only version of the Bible that you can have is this one, then we might go to different churches. It doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that you're right and I'm wrong. It doesn't mean that you're a Christian and I'm not. It just means that you have, you have created or we have created an issue that's going to cause us to divide in maybe the place that we worship. And then this last category, this is a big uh, $5 seminary word. We have primary, secondary, and tertiary. Don't y'all like that? Primary means one, secondary means two, tertiary means... Three. These are things of, uh, that are of third importance. The, these are items that are not crucial to faith in Christ or cooperation in a single church. We, we might actually have disagreement on uh, tertiary issues right here in this room. We can stand side by side and disagree on some things. They cause interesting discussions, but they don't cause us to, to say that you're not a Christian. And, we don't, and they don't even cause us to go to different churches. Your view on the end times. Uh, listen, I've read the book of Revelation. And there are people who've been reading the book of Revelation for centuries. And they don't agree on it. On exactly how it is. And that's okay. You might think one way, I might think a different way. And we can stand beside each other. And we can have some really interesting discussions. But it's not going to cause either of us to say, well, you're not a believer. And it's not going to cause either of us to say, we don't need to be around each other anymore. We can love each other in the midst of our differences. In times, our worship preference. I prefer this, you prefer that. We're going to say, that certainly is not an issue of faith, and it certainly is not an issue of you've got to go to a different church. Our version of the Bible, I told you it could fit into two different categories. I read from the English Standard Version when I preach. I actually read the Christian Standard Bible. Some of you have a King James Version. Some of you have a New American Standard Version. Some of you have an NIV. Some of you have a, a New Living Translation. Some of you have the Living Bible. Whatever Bible you happen to carry, this is a tertiary issue. As long as you're willing for it to be a tertiary issue. You see? It, it, we're not going to divide over that, and we're certainly not going to call somebody a Christian or not a Christian. Now, I have just a couple of minutes left, so I've got to get through this last quickly. But what about, you're going to ask, but what about this political issue? What about gluttony? What about homosexuality? What about gossip? What about addiction? What about envy? What about discontentment? What about greed, short temper, anger, judgmentalism, slander, lying, worldliness, pride, worry, idol worship, coarse talk, impatience, selfishness, etc.? Where do those things fall on those categories? Are those primary issues? Are those secondary issues? Are those tertiary issues? Can we get those back up here for just a second? I know it's going to take a second to do that. Well, I would encourage you, and I'm about to overly generalize, but I'm, I'm going to encourage you to use this in many areas of your life. Check this out. I think it can be any of the three. For instance, hear this. If it's a particular sin, one of those sins that I mentioned just a minute ago, and somebody comes and says, what I'm doing is not sin. Yes, I know what the Bible says, but I'm not listening to that. Or I'm just trying to explain it away. I don't want to deal with it, but I'm going to say God made me this way and it's his fault. There's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. That would be a primary issue. Because we would say what you're doing and, and the way that you're speaking and the way that you're living is not according to God's word. And you're wanting to try to deny the word of God and say it doesn't matter. That's a primary issue. We're going to talk to you about coming to know the Jesus of the Bible. How about this one? What I'm doing is sin. I recognize it. But the church should accept me anyway. I am not going to change. I don't want to. I recognize that what I'm doing is wrong, but I am unwilling to change. 
That might be a primary belief, but it definitely would be a secondary issue. And what it means is that you seem to be looking for a church that will allow you to continue in your sin with no accountability. Friends, that's not who we are. Part of loving eagerly is helping people to see that they might be wrong and encouraging them to live rightly. We can't stand with just no accountability. We all have areas that we need to work on. You do, I do. But we're here to work on them, not to try to dismiss them. Here's the third approach. And I want you to hear this real clearly. Somebody may come and say, I recognize that what I'm doing is sin, but I'm struggling. I'm tempted. I realize what I'm doing is wrong, but I keep going back. I want to do better. I want to get this out of my life, but I just, I can't. I I, I need help. I need some I need some encouragement. I need some accountability. We would see that as a tertiary belief. You have a struggle that I don't have. I have a struggle that you don't have. Let's do this together. Friends, if we if we had a sin check at the door, none of us would be sitting here. What we're saying is that regardless of the sin, if you're willing to let's work on it together, you are welcome here. We want, listen, if we don't, well, first of all, if we don't let sinners in, none of us are going to be here. Second of all, if we don't let sinners in, we're not doing our job. We're called to reach people. We're called to encourage people. We're called to show people the word of God. We're called to bring people to repentance. We can't can't reject people just because they have sin in their life. Name the sin. We've got to be willing to, to help them through that. To show them conviction. To show them a right way of living. And to encourage them along the way. Listen, can I tell you something? We would be better off if we would think about more things as primary, secondary, or tertiary. And I would be willing to tell you that most of the things that we argue about, and I mean we argue passionately about, do you know what category most of those things would fit into? Way down at the bottom. And maybe we need to just chill Listen, I'm all for us discussing and maybe even fighting for those primary issues. But when it gets down there to the bottom, we need to just put our arms around each other and say, hey, we can agree to disagree here. It's okay. Let's move forward together. Let's recognize that we're doing this together. Now, I realize what I've said here is just vastly overgeneralized. When you, when I'm... When a pastor gets up and tries in 25 minutes to tell you what we believe, trust me, we can't deal with it all. And so here's the question I want to leave you with. What do you believe? Where is your belief? Where is your statement of faith? What do you believe? Because friends, if we don't determine what we believe, How in the world can we expect to deal with primary and secondary and tertiary issues? How can we understand how we should practice? How can we understand how we should relate to one another? We must know. I must know what I believe. And I must stand strong on the convictions of my beliefs. Hey, at the end of today's service, if you've got a question, I'll be around. I'd love to talk with you. I'd love to maybe help you see something. I'm leaving town tomorrow morning. (laughs) 
It's a great time to preach a message like this, isn't it? But I'll be back. And again, I'd love to talk with you. Because, you know, when you, te- when you preach something like this or you teach something like this, everybody's got these fireworks going off in their heads. Well, what about, oh, what about, hey, let's talk about it. And let's go to the Word of God about it. And let's see what He has to say. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for all that you've done in our lives. Thank you for the privilege of walking with you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for what it teaches us. Help us, God, to live rightly, to love eagerly, to labor spiritually, and to long for eternity. We look forward to the day that you call us home and all things are made new. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing this. Come just as you Thanks again for joining us here at Setson Baptist Church Online. I hope that you've enjoyed our time of worship together. We would love to see you in person, but for right now, we're so glad that we can continue to connect in this way. If you would like to be a part of an online Bible study, we actually have at 945 every Sunday, a Zoom Bible study that you can participate in. All you have to do is send us your name uh, to the email address zoom at stetson.church. We'll send you the link back. That way you can join with that either this week or next week or in the weeks to come. It's just a way to build some community, dig a little deeper into God's word, and maybe make some friends within the life of the church. Also, uh, we would love to have you continue to join with us as we continue to worship together. Don't forget, if you'd like to give to our church, you can go to our website. It is stetson.church. And in the upper right-hand corner, there's a button that says Give. If you click on that, it will uh, explain to you all the ways that you can give to our church. I'm so glad that we've had this time together. I pray that through our worship and the sermon and just the time that we've spent together, that God has spoken to you in a powerful way. Let's continue to worship together and to see him do a work in our lives. We hope to see you again next Sunday. God bless you. Have a great rest of your week.